Hello everyone, my name is Tom Ebley. I am the community arborist for Open Lands. Uh, Open Lands is a Chicago regional conservation nonprofit. We have um, programs from everything to, from green schoolyards to um, water trails and waterways to forestry. Um, I work with the forestry department and I coordinate our tree planters grant. Uh, which you can check out uh, on our website. I'll put a link in the chat. But today, I am at the beautiful Garfield Park Conservatory, and we are going to be walking around the grounds and talking about some trees that are easily identifiable in the winter, and we're gonna talk about some skills that you can sharpen to help you identify trees in the winter time. So thank you so much for coming, and we will see you around. All right, so the first tree we're gonna look at today is the Eastern Redbud. This is Cirsus canadensis. Uh, it is an exceptionally common tree uh, in a lot of the Eastern United States. It's very commonly planted in Chicago for a number of reasons. Uh, it is super tolerant of urban conditions. It can tolerate almost any soil conditions that you throw at it. Uh, it also has very nice showy purple flowers getting into the identification factors uh, we can see here that it is alternate uh, so that is one bud per node let's switch over to this branch here so you can see how it's so alternate that it actually almost has a zigzag to it if you can take a look on it the the buds are pretty small about the head uh, the size of a like a ballpoint pin head they do have scales, they're dark in color, uh, and they're very, very rounded. The tip of the bud is going to be rounded, almost uh, spherical. And then the other thing you'll notice if you get a really close look is that there are some light colored lenticels that are on the new growth of the twig. As the twig matures, those lenticels are kind of gonna disappear and become a little bit more gray as you can see, if we switch over to like over here, forgive the coffee smudge on my background sheet. You can see that the, the twig has uh, matured in color a little bit and it's closer to gray than it is to that reddish with lenticels. Um, and then the last thing we'll take a look at is the mature bark of the tree. I'm looking at specifically this part down here. This is pretty indicative of uh, middle maturity, uh, you know, the, the branches and so forth. Once you get to the main trunk where the oldest bark is, you're gonna start to see um, some flaking. You can see like that if I rub my hand over, it exfoliates a little bit. And you can also see this reddish color. Um, the reddish color is gonna be more pronounced in some individuals than others but you're usually going to find it there. And that is Eastern Redbud, Cirrus canadensis. Oh, it's family Fagaceae. I forgot to mention this is also a legume. So we'll see if we can find some legume pods on a different tree to show you. Just real quick before we move on from the Redbud, we did find some pods on here. So whenever you see uh, a tree that has seed pods like this that look almost like green beans, um, then you're most likely dealing with a member of Fabaceae family, which is the legumes. Okay, this next tree that we're taking a look at is uh, black walnut. This is Juglans nigra. Um, it is another exceptionally common tree, uh, mostly in the woods of the eastern United States. It's not widely planted um, as a street tree. It is relatively uh, successful as a park tree. Uh, anywhere that it has plenty of space, it has considerable fruit that drops, so it's not something that you want to be planted um, over a sidewalk or anything like that where it could cause a trip hazard. Um, it is alternate, 
and one of the best winter ID characteristics that I've found is when you actually peel off a piece of bark. I've taken my um, my ID knife and I've just scraped that out a little bit. You will see this really rich uh, Hershey brown color. Oh, this is kind of the color that I'm looking for right here. Super duper dark chocolate brown and that just happens when you pop a piece of bark off like that. If you pop a piece of bark off and the underside or the underbark has that super rich dark chocolatey color, then the odds are you're dealing with a walnut. The other thing that's pretty distinct about walnut is you can see um, how deep the fissures are in here. So I'm, I'm sticking my, my finger inside the fissure of this bark here and it's almost, you know, it's almost three quarters of an inch deep. Those really pronounced fissures are another good sign that you're dealing with a walnut. The other thing that you can look for, particularly on the ground in the winter, is going to be the husks of the walnuts. These have all been munched and hollowed out um, by squirrels. When I was a kid, I used to find these on the ground and I would call them uh, pig noses because you can kind of see it almost looks like a snout right there once it's been emptied out. Um, there's a really good pig nose right there. So you'll find these nuts all around at the base. Um, the other sort of take it to the bank identification factor for a black walnut is chambered pith. So uh, I'll show you in a little bit how to actually look at the pith of a twig, but if you take a twig off of the tree and you split it down the middle to expose the pith, it's going to have chambers in it. So it's going to look like um, little uh, perpendicular lines going through the center of the pith. And this is black walnut, Juglans nigra. Okay, uh, we were able to find a walnut twig, so I wanted to show you uh, that pith that we were talking about, and I also wanted to be able to show you the buds. They are um, velvety, silvery gray in color. You can see the new growth on that walnut, so this season's growth is going to be a nice reddish brown color. You can also see how rounded the lateral buds are. So um, that's kind of an interesting feature is the difference in shape between the lateral buds and the terminal buds. The other thing that's pretty common on black walnut is this weird little structure on the bud there, which will eventually unfurl to be uh, a leaf or a petal. Um, the other thing that's pretty distinct about walnut is the shape of the bud scar. So you see it's very triangular with that bud sitting on top of the bud scar. So the base of the leaf does not cover the bud in leaf on conditions. So you see your triangular bud scar and then your bud on top. Now, what I really wanted to show you is this is what I meant by chambered pith. So when you cut in to the pith of this twig, you can see that it's separated into little teeny tiny chambers uh, think like bamboo would be something that would have a chambered pith-like um, habit. But this is that chambered pith that I'm talking about. So it's the stem is basically hollow, except it has these perpendicular separations in the pith. Okay, so the next tree we're going to talk about is northern catalpa, which is catalpa speciosa. Uh, this is an exceptionally common tree. Uh, I feel like I've said that for all of them, but this one is really common because it grows very, very well on its own. Uh, it could be classified as a ruderal or weedy species. Uh, I have a tendency to plant them on purpose because they establish really quickly. They grow really quickly. They stay uh, relatively strong throughout their entire lifespan. So it's not gonna be something that falls apart once it gets to a certain size. 
Um, the wood is very strong. Um, it's also uh, a pretty interesting, interesting tree because it's one of the only species, it's the only species we'll look at today that has a world arrangement, W-H-O-R-L-E-D, world, um, which means that there is more than two uh, buds per node or more than two leaves aris arising at each node. So you can see there's one leaf scar, two leaf scar, three leaf scars right there. Um, trying to see if I can find a good one. I think that's probably the best. Yeah, so this has got, this has got three or more um, leaves per node. You'll also notice that there are some lenticels on that twig uh, if you get in there. And then I don't know if you can see that super duper well, but the leaf scar is almost a perfect oval. And then on the inside of the leaf scar, you have the bundle scars, which is another feature that you can use uh, to identify things during the winter. Often, if you have a guidebook that is uh, detailed enough, it will tell you about the pattern of the bundle scars. And those bundle scars will be very specific for each, each different species that we're looking at. Um, the other interesting thing about catalpa is the fruit. You may know catalpa as the lady cigar tree. Um, these are bean pods, and actually if you split them open like this, it's full of these little windborne seeds that essentially the pods dry out and they split open and these little seeds go everywhere. Uh, and that's what makes it such a common tree. Uh, sorry, Garfield Park Conservatory. Um, Maddie, if you wanna take a shot up here in the canopy, you can see that for the most part, the fruit is very persistent. I don't know if it's just this tree specifically, um, but it, it seems like Catalpa have a tendency to hold on to their fruit almost all winter long. And then once things warm up in the springtime, that's when the fruit really split open and spread their seed everywhere. So you can think about it like the tree is holding on to its seeds until growing conditions are right for them to actually germinate when they hit the ground. Because these seeds that are on top of the snow right now are not going to survive to germination. Um, yeah, so this is northern catalpa, catalpa speciosa. Um, oh, the last thing I forgot to talk about was the bark. So you can see this one does not have uh, any dramatic fissures or ridges on it. Um, I would describe this as much more of a flaking bark. It does have that. When I rub my hand over the top, you can see that it's exfoliating a little bit. Um, nothing super duper remarkable other than the underbark color. If you flake off a little bit, you can see that it's a nice khaki color. Um, and the bark does not change too terribly much as the tree matures. It's basically always going to be this flaky, uh, semi-exfoliating bark. Okay. All right, next species we're going to talk about is the sweet gum. This is uh, Latin name liquid ambar styraciflua, also known as a gumball tree. Um, if you take a look at the ground over around here, um, you will see that there are many little spiky wooden balls all over the place, uh, as well as persisting to the tree. This is a really good winter uh, ID species because the fruit does have a tendency as some of the fruit has a tendency to hang on for a long time throughout the winter. The other reason that this is an easy tree to get in the winter is because of these super distinct buds. If you take a look at like the terminal bud there, you can see that it is um, very pointed. It's very pronounced and it has those really dramatic scales on there. So it's not like a really fine scale. It's like there's only a few very large bud scales that are present. The other thing that makes this uh, 
trees stand out in the winter is the yellowish greenish new growth. So you can see that this is last year's growth and then how it transitions immediately to a different color once the, the twig begins to mature a little bit. So it's um, very smooth and silvery on the, uh, what do we say, middle maturity bark is smooth and gray as opposed to the new bark or the new growth, which is that um, greenish yellow color. The other interesting thing that happens is if you'll notice these kind of this ridge that has occurred here, we call that a corky appendage. It puts off these corky appendages um, on those middle maturity twigs. So about the size of a pencil on up to about the size of your pinky is when you'll start to see those corky appendages or those corky ridges. Um, this is one of the only examples on this specific tree that I could find. Some trees do it very, very dramatically, and some trees do it uh, pretty seldom like this. But what this translates to, once the bark matures, is some pretty pronounced uh, ridges that you'll find on there. Um, this one, the color is a little hard to tell because we have all this beautiful lichen but it does stay closer to gray, um, not quite charcoal gray, a little bit lighter than that. Um, but yeah, then it has these it has these pretty pronounced ridges that you'll find um, throughout the tree. So once again, this is sweet gum. This is liquid ambar stracifluia, and my best winter ID tricks is first of all look for the fruit, and then you can take a look at the terminal buds to see if they're pointy and scaled and see if it has that yellow-green new growth. This is a really cool tree. It's much more common at points south of here. Um, southern Indiana it literally grows like a weed. Um, closer to St. Louis, Missouri, it grows like a weed. This is one of the trees that is being experimented with more and more in the Chicago region because it is more of a southern species and it is going to be hardy uh, and uh, be able to resist uh, climate change a little bit. It will be well adapted to a warmer climate here. Okay, the next tree that we're looking at is going to be the swamp white oak, Quercus bicolor. Um, bicolor, uh, the, the Latin species name, meaning two colors. Um, that is mostly in reference to the leaves, which obviously we don't have the luxury of seeing today, but the leaves are very light on the bottom and very dark on top. So it almost looks like two distinct colors of leaves. The other interesting thing about this tree that is bicolor is if we can take a look at this branch here, you can see how light this bark is and then how dark that flakiness is. This is a really, really common trait of swamp white oak. You are going to find this on every tree, uh, every species or every individual of the white, uh, excuse me, <laughs> swamp white oak is going to do this on every tree where once you get up to uh, branches that are about two fingers on up to the size of a square is going to have this very, very flaky, very, very peely, uh, two-colored bark in there. So that's another reason why we call it bicolor. That can also help you remember that, <coughs> excuse me, Quercus bicolor has the two colored flaky bark. The other thing that's important to look at with a um, oak species in general. So if you look at the overall twig, this is alternate. Actually, let's skip to this twig here. You can see quite well that it is an alternate species. So oaks, all oaks are going to be alternate. The interesting thing uh, also about oaks is you'll see that it is a cluster 
of buds at the terminal. So it's a clustered terminal bud. There are multiple buds at the very tip of the branch. That is another thing uh, that is indicative of oak species. If you look in here on the lateral buds for the swamp white oak, um, it's really hard to see right now, but they are scaled buds. But the thing that I try and keep in my mind around them is that they are globose. They are almost a perfect sphere, super duper rounded. So we have alternate clustered terminal buds. We have our super duper flaky multicolored um, branches anywhere from about uh, an inch in diameter up to about the size of uh, your wrist or your forearm is where you're going to see that that super duper flaky exfoliating bark. And then by the time you get to the mature bark, um, most of that distinctness is gone and it looks very barky. I'm not sure how else to say it. It is a white oak, so the bark in general is going to be relatively light in color, um, much more of a, a true gray. Um, and there's also not very distinct fissures or ridges. I would call this uh, almost uh, a flaking or exfoliating bark. If you rub your hand over the top again, you get some of that exfoliation not nearly as dramatic as on the smaller branches. Um, the other thing that you can look for, which I do not have, uh, I couldn't find underneath our nice 18 inch blanket of snow. If you can find an acorn or an acorn cap, the peduncle, which is the stem of that acorn, is going to be about that long. It's going to be almost two inches long. The swamp white oak has the longest peduncle of any of the oaks. So between the alternate twig arrangement, the clustered buds, the super flaky branches, and the elongated peduncle, you should be able to get yourself to uh, a positive ID on a swamp white. And actually, I'm just now noticing that we do actually have some persistent leaves. So you can see the color. This is the top side of the leaf. And you can see how light in color it is on the bottom side of the leaf. Obviously, this is not the, the same difference that we're going to see in the summer, but it is uh, very comparable. So this top side will be super dark green, and the bottom side is going to be super light green. So you can see the color difference there. Bicolor. Quercus bicolor. Swamp white oak. Okay, next we have the staghorn sumac, which is Rus typhina, R-H-U-S-T-Y-P-H-I-N-A, Rus typhina. It is a, um, some would call it a large shrub. I tend to call it a small tree, especially this stand is a really good demonstration of the potential. Um, I have seen some staghorn sumac that are uh, 8 and 10 inches diameter at breast height and anywhere from uh, 15 to 20 feet tall is about the biggest ones that I have ever seen. Um, they are very, very mature. Uh, it is a clone forming species. So you can see like maybe this guy right here is one of the original plants. And then we have these smaller individuals that are popping up all over the place around it. Those are um, propagating from the root system uh, of the staghorn sumac itself. And if we come in close, we can see that it is an alternate species. So it, uh, this is kind of an interesting one because they, they alternate almost in a spiral pattern, but it is only one bud per node, making it an alternate species. The reason they call it staghorn sumac is, I wish you could be here to feel it, because it is legitimately soft and velvety, and it is just exactly like the velvet um, on a buck's antlers in the springtime. The other thing that's interesting about this one 
is how soft and velvety and fuzzy those buds are. Uh, I mean, it's it's really amazing. It, it I keep saying velvety, but it is uh, it is like a natural velvet uh, covering the new growth on the stem and the bud itself. It is pretty hard to see the bud scar, but the the base of the leaf on a staghorn sumac this has got a big compound leaf on there and the base of that leaf almost entirely circles the bud so during the growing season when the staghorn sumac is actually leaf on you are not going to be able to see this velvety bud it's going to be completely covered by the base of the petiole the other thing that's pretty distinct about staghorn uh, smooth sumac also has this same fruit form um, but they're not as large as staghorn sumac is these paniculately born clusters of berries so it's a panicle fruit so it's on the very tip of the branches um, this one is losing color because we're getting pretty late in the winter but if i expose some of that uh, some of those interior fruits look how bright and red that is they are also like the rest of the new growth super duper velvety and fuzzy uh, really lovely red color if we'll zoom back up to the overall plant you can see that that's another one of the reasons why it is planted ornamentally because these fruits are going to persist all winter long wildlife go crazy over them uh, and it provides something really interesting to look at in the absence of uh, flowers and leaves. That's the other cool thing is when you have a, a big honking dramatic fruit like this, that also translates to some really dramatic flowers in the springtime, which maybe we'll show you on our next walk. Um, yeah, so staghorn sumac, it's beautiful. The last thing that I wanted to show you about this, uh, I mentioned earlier for the black walnut looking at the pith, and I just wanted to do a quick demonstration about how you would expose pith. So I use a box cutter because a sharper knife is gonna be a lot safer to use. You're gonna have your elbow at a right angle like this, and basically hold that stem um, parallel with your body, and then pull straight away. You never wanna be pulling towards yourself but I'm essentially just gonna skim into that branch until, or skim into your twig until I expose the pith. This, uh, it's almost like styrofoam, is what we call a diaphragmed pith. So staghorn sumac has diaphragm pith. I'll show you one other species that has an interesting pith in there, but you can see it's almost a sulfur yellow kind of color which makes sense because you see that same color is present on the buds as well. Uh, and it's almost the same color as the fuzz. So that is staghorn sumac, Bruce typhina, alternate, fuzzy buds, fuzzy twig, really dramatic fruit on the very tip. All right, next species we're gonna talk about is the Ohio buckeye which is Aeschylus glabra. Um, Ohio buckeye is another fairly common tree in the woods, not super duper common um, in the urban setting for whatever reason. It is one that I plant on a fairly regular basis because it is one of the most shade tolerant species in all of North America. Uh, in the woods in a regenerating stand of Ohio buckeye, these things will be growing in 100% shade. Um, so I like to use them for spaces in the parkway where there might be a giant honey locust or silver maple or something like that overhanging. This is an important one to talk about because it's one of our only opposite species of the day. So you can see that it has two buds directly opposed to each other on the twig. The other way of saying that is two buds per node. You can also see when you look at the, the leaf scars on here, the leaf scars are two leaf scars per node. 
as well. This is a very happy little tree. You can see how much growing it did last year. I mean, that's that's eight inches of, actually, coming down here. So there's my terminal bud scar with the, the leaves that go all the way around. So this is one season. This whole twig right here is one season of growth, which is pretty impressive. It does have a singular terminal bud. So there's only one terminal bud on there. I don't know if you can see it very well, but they are scaled. They have pretty dramatic scales on there. The rough or the hard part, the challenging part about uh, Aeschylus, there's a couple different um, common Aeschylus species that are in Chicago, uh, in the eastern half of the United States in general. There's Ohio Buckeye, which is what we're looking at now. There's yellow buckeye, and then there's Aeschylus hippocastinum, which is the horse chestnut. The only way that you can tell the difference, um, at least to my, my feeble mind, the only difference between an Ohio buckeye and a yellow buckeye is going to be the flowers. Yellow buckeye is going to have a yellow flower. Ohio buckeye is going to be much closer to creamy white, uh, a little bit off-white. Um, and then the horse chestnut flowers are crazy. But the difference between here is I know this is uh, an Ohio Buckeye number one because there's a sign. Um, number two, because the size of the bud is about the size, my, the terminal bud that is, is about the size of my pinky nail. If this was a horse chestnut, that bud would be about the size of my thumbnail. So the bud on a horse chestnut is much larger than the bud of an Ohio Buckeye. The other thing is a horse chestnut, horse chestnut is going to be sticky. Um, you'll rub your fingers on there. It's very, very sticky. It's very shiny. It almost looks like it is covered in resin. Whereas the Ohio Buckeye does not have that resinous um, resinous feel at all. In fact, it almost feels glabrous. It almost feels waxy smooth. So this is Ohio Buckeye, Aeschylus glabra. It is opposite, and it has this singular, very pronounced, scaled terminal bud. Uh, the last thing, we can take a look at the mature bark. Um, the bark is not super duper variable on a buckeye. Um, essentially, it starts off as a smoothish gray, and it only gets a little bit rougher as we go. Again, this is a light gray, uh, a light gray color here. So, Ohio Buckeye, Aeschylus glabra. Okay, the next tree we're going to talk about is one of my all-time favorites, which is Quercus macrocarpa, the burr oak. Um, Macrocarpa is the Latin name. Uh, macro meaning large, carpa meaning fruit. The bur oak has the largest acorn of any of the oak species. Um, when it is fully mature and still has the cap on and it's still on the tree, it can be uh, about the size of a golf ball or bigger. So it has very, very dramatic fruit. Just like the other oak species that we looked at, just like our swamp white oak, you can see that it is a cluster of terminal buds. Unlike the swamp white oak, the burr oak has a much more pointed scaly bud. The scales are really hard to see because they have kind of a waxiness to them in the winter. But at least on this one, you can see that it is much more pointed than the swamp white oak. You can see really well on this twig, this is an alternate, just like the rest of the oaks. Uh, clustered buds, um, pointed. What else am I looking for here? So similar to the sweet gum, we talked about the quirky appendages that can come off. This quirkiness right here is very, very common for burr oak. Um, this is going to happen on every single individual of the species. It may just be a little bit more dramatic on 
from individual to individual, but you are going to find this quirkiness on uh, every bur oak that you're looking at. So right here, it's not super dramatic, but if we come over here to this twig, you can really see how things escalate as the branch itself matures. So this is probably a first year, first year of growth right here. But once you get down to the second year's growth, you can see how quirky and gnarly that becomes. This translates to, we don't have a good example of super mature bark on this tree because this is a young individual, but this translates to very, very rough bark uh, very, very rough, mature bark on uh, on older individuals. So this is bur oak. It's alternate clustered terminal buds. And the best way to tell that you're looking at a bur oak is going to be those quirky appendages at various points on the branch. So some here, some here, some here. Yeah, bur oak, Quercus macrocarpa. So the next tree we are looking at is Gymnocladus dioikes, the Kentucky coffee tree. Uh, another one of my all-time favorites. Um, it is going to be alternate. Also, um, something that you will notice is it does not exactly have a terminal bud anywhere. As a matter of fact, if we take a look at the twig in general, the buds are extremely hard to see. Actually, that little, you may not even be able to see it on the camera, but that little bump right there is actually the bud. Um, so the bud is almost entirely contained within the twig itself. Coffee tree is one of the very last species to leaf out. Um, it's very common for me to get a call and say, hey, that tree that you just planted in my yard is dead. Uh, and then I'll look it up online. And this will be about April, something like that, end of April, um, early May, where I get these calls and I'll look it up. And sure enough, it's a coffee tree. So I can just call back and say, it's not dead. It just hasn't leafed out yet. These buds will not even start to develop. They won't even think about opening until, um, until early May. So it's one of the very last species to leaf out. One thing that can help you with winter ID is these, um, I think it's technically called a rachis, the, the middle part, the main part of the compound leaf is often stuck to the tree. So if you can see out on this branch here, there's a ton of these rachi that are still, rachises, whatever you want to call them, that are still stuck to the tree, which can help you identify. Um, in the first place, it'll help you identify that this tree, when it's leafed out, has compound leaves, and then you can move on from there. My best advice for getting a positive ID on a Kentucky coffee tree is going to be back to um, finding the pith. Just like with the walnut, just like with the, the uh, staghorn sumac, if you find the pith, this is going to be a take it to the bank factor. That super bright, um, salmon-y, pinkish color uh, Again, with the, the diaphragmed pith, that almost styrofoam textured pith that's going to have that super pink color, that's indicative of Kentucky coffee tree. I don't know of any other trees in our region that have this pith characteristic. If we go take a look at the bark, is another very interesting um, portion of the Kentucky coffee tree. It does peel almost in strips. But it's interesting because one side of the piece of bark is going to peel off. So you can see this kind of one-sided curly cue all over the place. And it gives it almost a, a, squiggly, a squiggly, flowy type of look to it. But what I want to get in here close and see if we can find is if you peel back 
one of those pieces. Of course, don't come to Garfield Park Conservatory and peel back the trees. This is just for education. But you can see that same, drop my twig. You can see that same salmon pink color is present on the interior of the bark. So if you break a piece of bark, you're gonna be able to find that same salmon pink color in there. But you can also see that color without breaking anything just by looking inside the furrows uh, of this tree. So from a distance, it does have uh, a silvery gray uh, color to it. But as you get closer and closer, you start to pick up suggestions of that pink, which is coming from the color that's present in the inner bark. So once again, this is Kentucky coffee tree, Gymnocladus dioikis. Uh, it is alternate. It does not have a pronounced terminal bud, but it is going to have the salmon pink pith, and it will most likely have rachis of the leaves still remaining on the branch in the wintertime. All right, so we had to revisit one other species because I found a really good example out here in the front yard. Um, the Kentucky coffee tree, you can see our, our pink diaphragmed pith there. The Kentucky coffee tree that we looked at earlier was an improved variety. So that was a male tree, something I didn't mention. Coffee tree is a dioecious species, meaning it has uh, individual trees that are male or have male flowers and individual trees that have female flowers and actually bear the fruit. So out here in the front yard at GPC, I found a female Kentucky coffee tree. And I just wanted to give you an example of the fruit that we're talking about here. Again, this is a bean pod, like a giant green bean. If you remember the fruit that we were looking at on the Eastern red bud. So that makes these bean pods is a sign that this is in the family Fabaceae and it is in fact a legume. So this is just probably the most dramatic uh, legume pod that you're going to find out there. And I just wanted to make sure that you all got to see an example of what the fruit looks like. So that is a Kentucky coffee tree fruit. And I guess here, if I can take a moment to split one of these things open, it's full of these very, very hard little seeds. Uh, literature says that one of these seeds is 500 to 1,000 times harder than a jawbreaker candy. So in order to grow a coffee tree from seed, you actually have to scarify that seed by either putting it through a bath of sulfuric acid or scratching the shell off with a, a steel file like you would use to sharpen your tools. Really remarkable tree, interesting fruit, very cool stuff. All right, the last tree of the day is going to be probably uh, one of the most common trees that you will find throughout the Chicago region, uh, in the urban environment that is, not necessarily in the woods, but this is the honey locust, which is Laditzia triacantha. Um, honey locust is exceptionally common as a street tree throughout the region for a number of reasons. Um, the, the biggest one that I can think of is that it is extremely salt tolerant. Obviously here in Chicago, it's 40 degrees right now, but uh, you might be able to tell that there's about 18 inches of snow on the ground. Uh, all that snow means that there's lots and lots of de-icing salt application that has to happen. So basically any high volume street is going to have a ton of honey locusts planted along the street just because they're one of the only species that can actually put up with that amount of road salt. Uh, the other thing is they are extremely tolerant of poor soil conditions. This is another ruderal species. So it's one of, uh, it's an early secessional species. It grows very quickly after a disturbance. Um, it is the bane of a cattle farmer's existence because they can take over 
a pasture that is unused and as little as about two years, you'll wind up with a forest of honey locusts if you're not careful. Um, I don't have any thorns to show you, but typically honey locusts, the straight species of honey locusts can have very, very dramatic, very large thorns on it. If we get closer to the twig, uh, again, there are no thorns here. This is a thornless variety, variety enormous is what it's called. You can see that this is an alternate species, so one bud per node. If you get in here really close, you're still not going to be able to see the bud. This is very similar to Kentucky coffee tree, the last tree we looked at, whereas the bud is not going to show itself until bud swell. So end of April, early May is when you'll start to be able to see those buds show up in the Chicago region. The interesting thing about the honey locust though, which is one thing that you can use as a, a winter ID factor, is you can see that where each bud is, uh, even though you can't see it, the twig is swollen. I, in my mind, I've always called that kind of a, a knobby knee kind of look, but you can tell that each place where a bud will arise is kind of swollen. Um, if you also get in there a little bit close, you can see that it does have lentisoles along the twig. Honey locust is one of those interesting species that, uh, like a lot of other trees, as the bark matures, um, it's going to change shape. So it starts off on the twig, it's very smooth, um, and it has those lentisoles that you can see. As it gets to be about the size of uh, your wrist or forearm, then you can still see the lentisoles, but it loses the shininess that you see here, and it becomes more of a dull silver color. And then by the time you get to the mature bark, you have these long strips of bark that curl up at the edges. Uh, and unlike the Kentucky coffee tree that only curls on one side, most often you're going to get that curling on both sides of these uh, ridges of bark. This is a little bit of a weird tree because again, it has all this beautiful lichen on it. But in my experience, honey locust is going to be a very dark gray. Um, much darker than the silvery gray of the Kentucky coffee tree. This is going to be closer to a charcoal gray. So honey locust, Gladitzia triacanthos. It is alternate. It does not have very pronounced buds in the winter, but it does have the swelling at each point where the bud is going to come. So... Gladitzia triacanthos.